Welcome to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, the Future Radio. Hey, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Monday, February 1st, 2021, and we are live. It's the first day of African American History Month, first official day, and uh, it was founded back in 1926 by Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who co-founded the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History, September 9th, 1915, which started out as the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. So during the month of February, we have programs and celebrations that commemorate and celebrate uh, the history of African Americans, our contributions to uh, the U.S., but also to the world. So we're going to uh, discuss some of that uh, today. We talked about uh, the annual theme for African American History Month. We talked about that on our Sunday show. Um, and the annual theme is dealing with um, uh, the Black family representation, identity. Uh, so we'll talk some more about that uh, today. There's a good article from uh, New Amsterdam News I was reading, The Black Family, Representation, Identity, and Diversity. That is the official uh, annual theme for 2021 for African American History Month. So I, I posted an article uh, earlier today from face to face africa.com dealing with Sarah Rector. Sarah Rector. Now, you've heard me talk about Sarah Rector a number of times in the past. And when I do my uh, lecture dealing with great African women in history, the mothers of civilization, Sarah Rector is one of the uh, African women that I talk about. Um, I shared this article. This article has been liked five thousand over over five thousand times on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. Meet Sarah Rector, the twelve-year-old who became America's youngest black millionaire in 1913. Meet Sarah Rector, the twelve-year-old who became Black America's youngest millionaire in 1913. Very, very interesting story about Sarah Rector. We're going to talk about that. A very interesting story with her because this ties into um, the Creek Indians owning African slaves. And this ties into the Black Freedmen, Black Freedmen's Indian Treaty of 1866 and ties into a lot of history. So we'll, we'll talk about Sarah Rector. Then also, um, and, you know, there were white people jealous of Sarah Rector. She was a, a millionaire, 12 years old, 1913. Then in 2021, you have white people jealous of Stacey Abrams. OK. Um, different day, same story. So you have some Republicans. Who on Monday, uh, February 1st, 2021. They launched this. Uh, Stop Stacy campaign. Uh, and they fear that Stacey Abrams is going to run for governor in the state of Georgia. Hopefully she will run for governor again. She runs for, again. She's going to win. But the independent group known as Stop Stacy said they will build a robust state and national fundraising operation targeting Stacey Abrams with opposition research, digital ads, and other media resources, according to Fox News. In the press release, the group described itself as a, quote, a national grassroots organization of engaged conservatives who are committed to protecting our future from Stacey Abrams. Her left, her left wing backers and their radical un-American agenda. Now we now keep in mind, see, I, I, I've been talking about how in the great state of Georgia and other states, how Republicans are coming up with these new laws, proposing these new laws 
to make it harder for people to vote, especially African-Americans, because they didn't like the outcome of the 2020 presidential election and the Georgia senatorial election. They didn't like the outcome. Now, look at the hypocrisy with this. You had spineless Republicans like Senator Ted Cruz and some other spineless Republicans back during the impe- the first impeachment trial of Donald Trump. OK, back in February 2020, who said it's too close to an election. We should let the voters decide. We shouldn't impeach Trump. We shouldn't hold this impeachment trial It's too close to an election. We should let the voters decide. So the voters decided. And they decided to vote Trump out of office. Some of those same spineless Republicans didn't like the outcome. So then they wanted to participate and instigate this insurrection to stop the the certification of the Electoral College votes. During a joint session of Congress on January 6, 2021, and they Start, they were promoting this fake stop the steal nonsense. Some of the same Republicans who said, let the voters decide when they didn't like how the voters decided, then they wanted to overturn the election results. Now you have re- Republicans in many, uh, in a lot of these states that have a, a, a Republican uh, dominated state legislature and, and in Georgia. Now what they're trying to do is they're trying to um, come up with new laws, especially targeting mail-in ballots, to make it harder for people to vote. And now you have some of them launching this uh, Stop Stacy campaign because they're so uh, they're so scared. Of Stacey Abrams. Let me see. There was an article from. Um, there was an article from. The Guardian. And we want to pull this one up here. There was an article from the Guardian dot com. We talked about this the uh, a couple of days ago, and it deals with. Uh, the about 106 um let me see if we can pull this up 106 new uh bills that they're proposing to restrict uh uh voter access okay so there is um okay so you have this one here from the Guardian, in 2021 legislative sessions, lawmakers in 28 states have pushed a whopping 106 bills that would restrict voting access. All right, uh, let's see here. Uh, we're going to show you this one. I want people to check this article out. So they're so scared of this African American woman who's also been nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. Okay. Not a Nobel Peace Prize, but a Nobel Peace Prize. Um, They're so scared of her that they're trying to put money behind stopping her. Read this from January 30th, 2021 from uh, TheGuardian.com. In 2021 legislative sessions, lawmakers in 28 states have pushed a whopping 106 bills that would restrict voting access. Uh Uh-huh. Now, these are some of the same people who say we need unity. Now, uh, right after the November 3rd election, and and the election results didn't go that way, they weren't talking about unity, they were talking about stop the steal. Now that all this is blown up in their face, now they're talking about, oh, 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 we need unity. 
Okay. Uh, so, so check out this article here from, uh, from uh, theguardian.com. In 2021 legisl legislative sessions, lawmakers in 28 states have pushed a whopping 106 bills that will restrict voting access. Okay. So you have this taking place. Then in Rochester, New York, you have police officers scared of a little nine-year-old black girl. So much so they had the pepper sprayer. So much so they had the pepper sprayer. You got white people scared of Stacey Abrams. You had white people jealous of uh, Sarah Rector back in 1913. Then you got police officers who were so scared of a nine-year-old African-American girl, they had a pepper spray. I understand she she was having a, a mental issue and things like that. I understand that. That's, you, but show me, I, I want to know how many nine-year-old white girls you pepper sprayed. That's what I want to know. Is that the first time you dealt with somebody who had a mental issue or a child who had a mental issue? One of the officers was reported to saying, you're acting like a child. She responded, I am a child. Now, you have the officers who've been suspended. Um, the officers involved in the incident were suspended while an internal investigation is conducted. The spokes, uh, spokesman for Mayor Lovely Warren said, NBC News has his article, Rochester Police Pepper Sprayed a Nine-Year-Old Girl. Why didn't a crisis team respond? You know, so we'll, we'll talk about this. But once again, now, there's something called adultification bias adultification bias when it comes to african-american girls i talked about this when i did the, my panel discussion with the three sisters dealing with cardi b cardi b and megan the stallion song wop in the video and negative corporate controlled hip-hop and one of the things i talked about with adultification bias is how oftentimes the stereotypes associated with African-American women are projected onto African-American girls and African-American girls are treated as if they are older and oftentimes treated more harshly than girls of other uh, races their same age will be treated, especially white girls. It's been with adultification bias. Okay, we're coming up on a break. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 19 a.m. Superstation of Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. All right, stand by, everybody. Stand by. When we come back, we'll talk about Sarah Rector. How's everybody doing? For 25 years, the Black History 101 Mobile Museum has carried on the rich legacy of the Black Museum movement in America by showcasing original artifacts of the Black experience at colleges, universities, K-12 schools, corporations, libraries, conferences, and cultural events, making it the most traversed Black History mobile exhibit in American history. Dr. Khalid El Hakim is the founder of the Black History 101 Mobile Museum, and he is a highly sought after public speaker on topics of black history, social studies, education, museum studies, hip hop and race relations. Dr. Khalid was named among the change makers for NBC Universal's Erase the Hate campaign and listed as one of the 100 men of distinction for black enterprise. He recently founded the Michigan Hip Hop Archive on the campus of Western Michigan University. The Black History 101 Mobile Museum is currently scheduling in-person and virtual exhibits nationwide. For more information, please contact Dr. Khalid Al-Hakim directly at 313-645-4197, 313-645-4197. Or visit their website at blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. That's blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. You can also email him at bhistory101 at yahoo.com. bhistory101 at yahoo.com.
Visit 4GlossyGirls.com. That's the number 4GlossyGirls.com. And follow them on Instagram at 4GlossyGirls. Are you getting ready for fall or winter? We have the solution for all seasonal clothing needs. Cometicwear.com is the go-to online source for Cometic African fashion and lifestyle products with a contemporary twist. We're committed to offering unique styles reflecting our African heritage. Cometicwear.com is inspired by Cometicscribes.com to influence our people in learning and showing pride. Please visit our website at cometicwear.com. Black Bees products are a collection of natural, organic, personal care products with an appreciation of nature and bees. Our philosophy is without bees, we have nothing. We are honoring our now Valley ancestors who understood the importance of bees. Black Bees created a high quality, natural, organic, personal care line that would be affordable to everyone. Hope you try and enjoy our Black Bees products line and come back and visit us at blackbeesproducts.com. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation of Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Monday, February 1st, 2021, first day of African American History Month, but you know, we deal with African American history basically, you know, every day. At least here at the African History Network. Um, so the call in number is 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. Uh, I was looking for something here. Let me see. Which one is it? Okay. Well, we, uh, also, I'm going to try to squeeze in uh, this story dealing with, uh, there's a huge uh, article from the New York Times. It's about 8,000 words from the New York Times dealing with um, 77 days after uh, the election or something. Where is that article? Let me pull it up. I had it here. And it ties into uh, the insurrection and the planning of the insurrection. More information is coming out dealing with the planning of the insurrection and people financing it. Uh, like the uh, woman that's the heir to the Publix uh, grocery store chain fortune. Um, the 77 days, Trump's campaign to subvert the election. This is from. It's a, a huge article from the New York Times, extensive reporting from uh, from the New York Times. And it came out. Well, what day was this? Um, yeah, January 34th. It came out Sunday. Yeah, because I saw I, I read some of it on Sunday. Uh, and it's exposing more of the planning surrounding the uh, insurrection attempt to overthrow the government. 77 days, Trump's campaign to subvert the election. Hours after the United States voted, the president, former president Donald Trump, declared the election a fraud, a lie unleashed, a, a lie that unleashed a movement that would shatter democratic norms and up in the peaceful transfer of power. Okay, so uh, his second impeachment trial 
is scheduled to start uh, the week of February 8th. He just brought on after losing about five attorneys because they quit. He just brought on two other ones. We'll see how long they last. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about this also. Okay, check out this article here from New York Times. 77 days, Trump's campaign to subvert the election. All right, now on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora. Because right now it's correct wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the race of a man or woman's uh, thoughts, you can control the comforts of their actions because the mind can't do it, teach what it doesn't know. All right. Um, if you like this type of information, you can donate to the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. All right. Uh, I want to get into uh, this story here dealing with uh, Sarah Rector. So I, I've talked about Sarah Rector a number of times in um, when I deal with, uh, I do a, a lecture series called uh, Great African Women in History, The Mothers of Civilization, Great African Women in History, The Mothers of Civilization. And I deal with different African women from different periods of time of history, antiquity, you know, ancient times, uh, and uh, even some that are still alive today. Sarah Rector is a very, very interesting story because this deals with a uh, period of history that uh, a lot of people don't uh, are not really familiar with. OK, so face to face Africa dot com has a good article uh, dealing with this. Meet Sarah Rector, the 12 year old girl. Uh, the 12 year old who became America's youngest black millionaire in 1913. And uh, we're going to, I'm going to try to pull this article up here. Um, okay. So, the, Sarah Rector uh, was born in Indian Territory in, 19, in, in 1903, uh, 1902, March 3rd, 1902. Okay. And let me see, let me pull this up here in just a second. March 3rd, uh, 1902, according to sources, uh, she was considered, quote unquote, colored, though not African-American. OK, but she was African-American. Her parents were owned by Creek Indians before the Civil War. Uh, before her parents were owned by Creek Indians before the Civil War. Uh, as the. And then uh, she and some 600 other uh, African-American children were in, uh, were enslaved, okay? Uh, and they were entitled to land allotments as the children of enslaved people belonging to the Creek Indian Nation, okay? Belonging to the Creek Indian Nation. So I still come across some people, you know, some people don't know that some Native American nations owned African slaves. Uh, the Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek, Cherokee, and Seminole Indians all owned uh, African slaves. Now, you may have some different branches of those nations, like uh, uh, one of my teachers, Professor James Small, told me that the Red Tail Creek Indians did not own slaves, but you had some other Creek nations, branches, sub-nations that did own African slaves. Okay, so I keep that in mind as well. But what happened was uh, you have because of the Civil War and during the Civil War, what are known as the five civilized tribes of Native Americans, they all fight on behalf of the South uh, during the Civil War. And they take up arms against the Union because they want to maintain slavery. When they take up arms against the Union, what this does is this. Um, violates the uh, treaties they already had with the Union. Prior to the Civil War, uh, these Native American uh, nations were, uh, they had Indian territories. When they took up arms against the Union, they violated those treaties 
And then after the Civil War, those territories are going to be taken back. They're going to be put on Indian reservations. So if we look at this article, it talks about uh, 1866. Now, this history ties into the history of Tulsa, Oklahoma and Black Wall Street. Because Tulsa, Oklahoma was founded by Creek Indians. Um, when they uh, go, they, when they go into Oklahoma uh, during the Trail of Tears, okay, uh, and then they're going to be pushed off their land in Southeast United States, the uh, Indian Removal Act of 1830. So uh, they go into Oklahoma uh, on the Trail of Tears, and uh, they take their African slaves with them. Uh, so Tulsa, what we know is Tulsa, Oklahoma, is going to be founded somewhere around 1834, 1836. But in 1866, the Creek Nation signed a treaty with the United States government promising to emancipate their 16,000 slaves and incorporate them into their nation as citizens entitled to equal, uh, equal interests in the soil and national funds. Two decades later, the federal the federally imposed Dawes Allotment Act of 1887 sparked the the Dawes Allotment Act of 1887 sparked the beginning of the total assimilation of the Indians of of the so-called five civilized tribes by forcing them to live on individually owned lots of land instead of communally as they had done for centuries. OK, so. This ties also into the Civil War, the history of slavery, the Dawes Allotment Act of 1887. The Dawes Allotment Act of 1887, what that did was redistributed um, about 138 million acres of land. And it was supposed to be redistributed between Native Americans and uh, Black Indians, basically. But two thirds of the land went to white people. All right. Uh, Britannica.com, which is the official website of Encyclopedia Britannica, they have a good entry on the Dawes Allotment Act. And um, I encourage people to check it out. And there's some other sources you can look at also, but this is one that's top of mind. Um, Britannica.com, Dawes Allotment Act, D-A-W-E-S. All right. And this was named after Senator Henry L. Dawes um, uh, of Massachusetts. And the Dawes Allotment Act, what it did was it uh, the Native Americans who thus received land became U.S. citizens subject to federal uh, local laws. Uh, the original supporters of the act were genuinely interested in the welfare of the Native Americans, but there was not enough votes in Congress to pass it until it was amended to provide that any land remaining after the allotment to Native Americans would be available for public sale. OK, uh, the combined influence of friends of the Native Americans and land speculators assured passage of the act. So it was. It, and it should tell you. Uh, the act also provided that any surplus land may be made available to whites who by 1932 had acquired two thirds of the 138 million acres Native Americans had held in 1887. OK, so this is redistributing about 138 million acres of land. And what happened was you had white people who found out about this redistribution of land. And to get this land, the Native Americans had to anglicize their names. They had to take on white names uh, or English names, anglicize their names. So white people found out about this. So they were paying five dollars to have their names added to the dolls rolls. OK, so they could get that land also. And they ended up getting two thirds of the land. Go research the Dawes Rolls and the Dawes Allotment Act of 1887. 1887. This was a massive land giveaway 
that African Americans are largely going to be shut out of once again, just like the Homestead Act of 18, uh, 1862 and the Southern Homestead Act of 1866. All right. So uh, check this out at uh, Britannica.com, Dawes General Allotment Act of 1887. This is why when I hear people talk about uh, African-Americans just need to try harder. I, I remember Jared Kushner a few months ago. He said he said for Donald Trump's policies to be successful, African-Americans have to want to succeed. So what, what are you talking about? People don't want to deal with the laws and policies that were put in place to maldistribute wealth upon resources. We've always wanted to succeed. Trying harder wasn't the issue. <laughs> the issue was an unlevel playing field. And, 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 and laws and policies put in place to maldistribute wealth upon resources into the hands of Europeans. It, it, it wasn't trying harder was not the issue. We just have to understand history. Trying harder was not the issue. Okay, let's continue here. So the land, uh, these lands that were often granted to former slaves were usually worthless, inferior, infertile, and rocky. While uh, fertile lands were reserved for white settlers, in fact, believing that it was worthless, Sarah Rector's family even petitioned the court to sell the land as the family could not pay the $30 in property tax, okay? Uh, and let me see something here. I had a picture. They could not pay the $30 in property tax. Okay, so uh, what, her, what, a, what happened was her father petitioned the court to sell the land. Uh, and then fortunately, fortunately, his petition was denied by the Muskogee County OK, by the Muskogee County because of certain legal restrictions. Now, he then decided to lease the land to the Standard Oil Company, the Standard Oil Company. Uh, leased the land where independent oil driller B.B. Uh, B. Jones found a gusher bringing in twenty five hundred barrels, uh, bringing in twenty five hundred barrels of oil. OK, so and let me try to pull this up here. Um, so little Sarah Rector began receiving an income of three hundred dollars per day. Uh, sometimes over seven thousand dollars a day. So this development came as a surprise to everyone, especially uh, the U.S. government. especially U.S. US government officials, as they discovered that some land allotments uh, or some land allottees like Sarah Rector had crude oil and other minerals underneath the soil, Sarah Rector quickly became, uh, quickly came to public light. And let me try to pull up a, a picture of Sarah Rector here. Um, let me see. There's one here in the article. I'll show you. So she became, uh, there were numerous articles written about Sarah Rector, numerous stories uh, written about her. Uh, she was known as the richest, Af they actually called her Afro American. She was known as the richest Afro American girl. Because as I, as I've talked about before, the term Afro-American was not created in the, in the 1960s. The term Afro-American goes back to the 1830s. Just like the term African-American was not created by Reverend Jesse Jackson, as some people still believe. The term African-American, the earliest recorded usage goes back to about May 1782 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Washington Post has two articles dealing with the term African-American is older than we thought. March 29th, 1964, uh, in Malcolm X's uh, speech, The Battle of the Bullet, 
That's now that's the first time that I know that he gave the speech. He gave it three times that I know of March uh, 29th, 1964 in Washington Heights, New York, three days after he met with Dr. King at the uh, U.S. Senate debate for the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Then he gave it um, April 3rd, 1964 in Cleveland, Ohio. Then he gave it uh, again April 4th, 1964 in um, Detroit, Michigan at the historic King Solomon Baptist Church in Detroit. Okay, this is the month after, uh, this is shortly after he officially separated from the Nation of Islam, which was March 8th, 1964, but before he goes to Mecca, which is late April, 1964. All right, so, and in that speech, Malcolm uses the term uh, African-American. It's in the transcript and the video is on YouTube. I have the, I have the video as well. That's 1964. So they were using the term Afro-American back at this time, 1913, because it goes back to the 1830s. You also have the uh, 1898, you have the Afro-American Council that was founded, one of the first civil rights organizations founded by uh, uh, Thomas T. Fortune and Bishop Alexander Walters. 1892, you have the National Afro-American League, which is basically like the first civil rights organization. So these are old terms, these are not new terms. Okay, let's continue. So, uh, once again, 313-778-7600 is the call-in number if you have a question or comment. Uh, we have any callers, Shakita? Let me know. Phone lines are be quiet. Uh, let's continue. So, she's written about a lot in newspapers. Uh, she had so much money that white people wanted to reclassify her as actually being white. That's a whole nother story. Uh, seriously, they, she had so much money. White people wanted to reclassify her as being white as they did. Some Native Americans, Native, some Na Native Americans were classified as white. So this development came as a surprise to everyone, especially the U.S. U.S. government officials, as they discovered that some land allottees like Sarah Rector had crude oil and other minerals underneath the soil. Rector uh, quickly came to public light. Local newspapers, uh, local newspapers, uh, uh, the Kansas City Star, local newspaper, the Kansas City Star, publicized its headline, Millions to a Negro Girl, Sarah Rector, 10-year-old, has income of $300 a day from oil. This is, they published this story September, 3rd, uh, September 1913. In uh, January 1914, in January 1914, the newspaper continued with the story. Oil, oil made, they call her a picking rich. Oklahoma girl with $15,000 a month gets many proposals. Four white men in Germany want to marry the Negro child that they might share her fortune. The Savannah Tribune also wrote, oil well produces neat income. Negro girls $112,000 a year. So you so you're going to have these you're going to have these stories written about Sarah Rector. All right. Uh, she becomes known throughout the country. And she's like the richest Afro-American girl. Now, according to records, Sarah Rector's guardianship switched from her parents to a white a white man named T.J. Porter, T.J. Porter. She also received numerous requests for loans, money gifts, and even marriage proposals from Germans. The Oklahoma legislature also shockingly declared her to be a white person due to her wealth. Let me, uh, and uh, I've read articles dealing with this, how, uh, and I don't, I don't have time to get into it now, but I've read articles dealing with this, how they wanted to reclassify her as white. Okay, so I, uh, you know, it's um I guess it's something like uh she, okay so she has so much money we 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 can't let this negro afro american girl have this much money and still be negro and afro afro american so we have to change 
her identity to be white. So we have to claim her. OK, we don't want African-Americans to claim. Her. We don't want black people to claim. her. She has so much money, she can't possibly still be Negro. So we're going to have to claim her. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Oklahoma legislature also shockingly declared her to be a white person due to her wealth. Now, I understand. Because I know there's some people saying, oh, well, Black's Law Dictionary and treaties and all this stuff. I understand the classification of white. I've dealt with that before. But she wasn't white. Before. They, they didn't classify her as white before she had the money. I understand black is a legal status. White is a legal status. I understand people immigrating from uh, uh, North Africa classified as white, like Mustafa Hefni in 1978. I've done lectures on all that. I know all that. I understand the uh, uh, the the the, uh, the petition of the free sundry Moors in 1790 in South Carolina and all that. I know, I know that I understand that. I know Washita Moors all this, but she wasn't she wasn't they weren't trying to classify her as white before she got the money. Only thing that changed was her bank account. They weren't trying to classify her as white before she got the money. She was already part of, part of the Creek Indian Nation before the gusher was discovered, before she got the money. So what, why, why do you want to classify as white now? Research the petition of the Free Sundry Moors of South Carolina of 1790. I, I know all about that. Yeah, I'm familiar with all that history. But, but, but why they want to classify as white once she got some money? See, that's the question we should ask. So. Um, once eight, once she turned 18, she left Tuskegee and moved to Kansas City, Missouri, with her family into what is known as the Rector Mansion. Sources say she was a, mil uh, a millionaire by then, owning stocks and bonds, a boarding house, a bakery, a boarding house, a bakery, and um, the Busy Bee Cafe in Muskogee, Oklahoma as well as 2,000 acres of prime river bottomland, bottomland. But press soon turned from the novelty of her riches to reports of legal and financial woes, including mismanagement. America's youngest millionaire died at age 65 on July 22, 1967 in Missouri, leaving behind three sons. Sources say her wealth was diminished, but she still had some working oil wells and real estate holdings, okay? So uh, there's also an article from blackpast.org, okay? Check that out for the sake of time. I, I don't have time to just get, don't have time to get deep into this. But there was also, there's also an article from blackpast.org that talks about uh, Sarah Rector, and it talks about the Dawes Allotment Act as well. Uh, now, era, uh, um, Oklahoma gets statehood in, in 1907, this is why Bass Reeves, the the the, the African American lawman who is believed the character of the Lone Ranger is based upon, this is why Bass Reeves had to retire because of segregation uh, when Oklahoma became a state in the Union in 1907. He was uh, uh, he was a uh, deputy sheriff and arrested like 3,000 uh, criminals. Um, and when Oklahoma, became, so prior to Oklahoma become a, a state in the Union, it was a U.S. territory. When it became a state in the Union in 1907, he had to retire uh, because of segregation. But it, in the article from blackpass.org, it talks about how uh, when Oklahoma statehood became imminent in 1907, the Dawes Allotment Act divided creek lands among the creeks and their former slaves okay now this is something that dr claude anderson has been talking about for years dr claude anderson is one of my teachers i've interviewed him a number of times we have private conversations that will stay private also um but he's been talking about the dawes allotment act and trying to get this enforced for years because uh, a few years ago uh, he said that uh, 
uh, he had identified about 200,000 uh, black people who would qualify for who because of their ancestry and they were descendants of um, former slaves, the, the black freedmen who were uh, became part of those Native American nations. We got pushed out of those treaties in 1941. OK, we got pushed out of those treaties in 1941. So. Uh, these these laws are still on the books today and they're being enforced for the five civilized tribes of Native Americans. But a lot of African-Americans don't know about this. And um, so, you know, he and, and other people have been trying to get this enforced. And in the Black Freedmen Indian Treaties, that is one of the legal reasons and legal examples for reparations. Because a lot of a lot of a lot of the um, arguments for reparations are being made are not legal arguments; they're they're, they're they're emotional arguments. Okay, this is the Black Freedmen Indian Treaties of 1866. That's a that's a legal argument for reparations. But uh, so check that one out as well. Okay, and then it goes on to say lands granted to former slaves were usually the rocky lands of poor agricultural quality. Sarah Rector's allotment of 160 acres was valued at $556.50. And I'm trying to pull this up from blackpath.org also. Okay. So all this ties into history. This ties into treaties. This ties into the history of slavery, uh, civil war, reconstruction. All this ties into history. Let's see. Okay. So a lot of this is redundant. Now, uh, national African American leaders such as Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois became concerned about uh, uh, Sarah Rector's. Um, they became concerned about Sarah Rector's uh, welfare. None of the allegations were true. Sarah Rector and her siblings went to school in Taft, an all-black town closer than Twine uh, in Oklahoma. They lived in a modern five-room cottage and they owned an automobile. That same year, Sarah Rector enrolled in the Children's House, a boarding school for teenagers at Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. Okay, so check this out also from uh, blackpast.org, uh, uh, dealing with Sarah Rector. Okay, let's continue here. Um, uh, all right, so that's a little known history fact right there dealing with uh Sarah Rector and it ties now, so it, and then it ties to the history of Black Wall Street because, like I said, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, where Black Wall Street was, the, uh, the business district, the which began at the intersection of Greenwood, Archer, and Pine. This is believed where the Gap Band gets their name from because the Gap Band is from Tulsa, Oklahoma, G-A-P, Gap. Um, the word Tulsa comes from the Creek Indian word Talasi. That's where the word Tulsa comes from. So in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and even in the community where African Americans live, North Tulsa, they had a small African-American population there as well. It wasn't 100 percent black. They had a small African. They, I'm sorry. They had a small Native American population. All right. Uh, read the book from. Read the book from Hannibal B. Johnson, uh, Black Wall Street, from riot to renaissance and Tulsa's historic Greenwood district this is probably the best book dealing with the history of Black Wall Street, uh, Black Wall Street from riot to renaissance in Tulsa's historic Greenwood District. I also, I also have a two-hour lecture that I've done dealing with the history of Black Wall Street. It's available at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Okay, so um, I, I want to go to this clip here before we get out of here, uh, Shakita. Uh, we got a couple minutes left. Uh, this is from uh, MSNBC, switching gears here. This ties into the article from the New York Times. New reporting shows the careful coordination of the Capitol attack. Uh, this is from Deadline White House, February 1st, 2021. Let's go to this clip, Shakita. Because 
you know all those cats that I just displayed on that reel spreading their disinformation. The thing that strikes me is, one, they knew at the time that what they were saying was untrue. They were saying it to placate Donald Trump. And two, it's now evidence against all of them, whether criminal or, or, or in the trial, but, but evidence that their words cause death and destruction. Yeah, that's the part that they can't walk away from. Uh, you, you can, you know, right. talk about unity and, and dance around a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, noise. But the reality of it is we listen to you for the run up uh, of this election. We listened to you on election day. We heard what you said after the election about it being stolen. So yeah, the, you know, this is, this is exhibit A uh, against all of them for, for, contributing to what happened on January 6th. You cannot walk that back. And so I think, you know, the, all right, pause it right there. the Shakita. smart political thing to do in the face of all... Pause right there. Okay, we'll, we'll play this again uh, tomorrow night. All right, those watching on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, and uh, our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel, keep watching. We're going to keep broadcasting. We're out of time here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation WFDF. We'll be back tomorrow night. Remember, right now, it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. Stay tuned for Pastor Greg Davis. We'll talk to you tomorrow night. Peace. All right, stand by, everybody. Okay, um, everybody, yeah, African American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. Email us at customer service at African History Network.com. Customer service at African History Network.com will let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. Uh, my online course is starting up. Wednesday, February 3rd, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We do with thousands of years of history. Uh, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Uh, email me at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com. ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com. Uh, for more information, it's regularly $130 on sale, $80. It is a eight week, 16 hour uh, online course. You can watch from around the world. Uh, it's 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. on Wednesdays. And uh, we do the classes live and then we record them. So you can go back and watch them over and over again. You can ask questions during the class. We have live chat, uh, you know, uh, text uh, chat. And we deal with what led up to the transatlantic slave trade happening. We go back, we start with ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, uh, and deal with thousands of years of history. When we talk about the transatlantic slave trade, we can't uh, start in 1619 and we can't start in 1441. We have to deal with history leading up to the transatlantic slave trade happening. And also we have to deal with the fact that um, African people have been in the Americas going back tens of thousands of years. As well, that's what David, uh, that's what uh, Dr. David M. Hotep talks about in his book. The first Americans were Africans, documented evidence, and I use a lot of book sources, uh, articles, a uh, number of different references. We have video clips, etc. Okay, you don't have to buy any of these books to uh, follow along or anything like that, or to understand what I'm talking about. But uh, I give you these references. Toya asked him out on Clubhouse. No, I'm not on Clubhouse. I've seen people post about it. I need to check out Clubhouse. Why should I be on, should I be on Clubhouse, Toya? Let me know. All right. So I, I want to go. So uh, email us at a, uh, ahn show at africanhistorynetwork.com. Ahn show at africanhistorynetwork.com for more information. And then I posted the link there. You can register for the online course. And when you register it, uh, there's bonus content that you can watch uh, also. Do you have an idea or business that requires app development or thinking of moving your IT resources to the cloud? We have postpaid and profit sharing plans for unique ideas or profitable businesses. Who can take advantage of this unique program? Entrepreneurs with unique ideas, startups, small to medium businesses. Contact us, 267-209-0352. Visit nomadicsystems.net, nomadicsystems.net today.
Intuitive Design Clothing is an online accessory store that sells one-of-a-kind signature statement pieces for men and women. They also specialize in fashion consultations, closet organization, and decorating small spaces. Are you looking for a statement piece for a special affair, or would you like to add some select pieces to your ensemble of accessories? If you're looking for something different, definitely contact Kathy Norman, owner and CEO of Intuitive Design Clothing. Visit their website, intuitivedesignclothing.com. That's intuitivedesignclothing.com, and you can email her at info at intuitivedesignclothing.com. Intuitive Design Clothing is where every entrance is a grand entrance. Are you getting ready for fall or winter? We have the solution for all seasonal clothing needs. Cometicwear.com is the go-to online source for Cometic African fashion and lifestyle products with a contemporary twist. We're committed to offering unique styles reflecting our African heritage. Cometicwear.com is inspired by Cometicscribes.com to influence our people in learning and showing pride. Please visit our website at cometicwear.com. Soul Natural Beauty Products offers organic, plant-based skin and hair care products that will rejuvenate skin and naturally grow and thicken hair. Their whipped shea butter can heal or restore damaged skin cells to prevent hyperpigmentation and skin breakouts. All products are made with organic plant-based ingredients. Their maximum hair growth oil is fortified with organic herbal extracts and undeniably proves that Mother Nature knows best. It thickens, lengthens, softens, and conditions all types of hair. They even guarantee hair improvement within 90 days or a full refund. Their all-natural 24-hour deodorant leaves the body smelling fresh without sweating for up to 24 hours. It does not stain fabric, goes on smoothly, and has a refreshing lavender and frankincense aroma. It can be used by men, women, and even children. Place your order today at SoulNaturalBeautyProducts.com. That's SoulNaturalBeautyProducts.com. And follow them on Facebook at Soul Natural Beauty Products. All right. I, I want to go to this clip here. This is from uh, Deadline White House, uh, Nicole Wallace. She's speaking with Michael Schmidt, who was run, one of the writers of uh, this bombshell article from the New York Times uh, dealing with. Uh, 77 was it 77 days, 77 days, Trump's Trump's campaign to subvert the election. OK, uh, let's go back to this clip here. Just a second here. Real spreading their disinformation. The thing that strikes me is one, they knew at the time that what they were saying was untrue. They were saying it to placate Donald Trump. And two, it's now evidence against all of them, whether criminal or, or, or in a trial, but, but evidence that their words cause death and destruction. Yeah, that's the part that they can't walk away from. Uh, you, you can, you know, right. talk about unity and, and dance around a lot of a lot of, uh, you know, noise. But the reality of it is we listen to you for the run up uh, of this election. We listened to you on election day. We heard what you said after the election about it being stolen. So yeah, the, you know this is this is Exhibit A uh, against all of them for for contributing to what happened on January sixth. You cannot walk that back. And, and so I think you know the the smart political thing to do in the face of all of this, which we know they won't, is to say. My bad. We got that wrong. We were wrong about this. But yet and still they st they're still engaged in it. You still have 
this this level of noise out here from some uh, that continue to perpetuate the lie. And so whether it's in the form of a Taylor Green and her and what she's saying and the fact that McConnell seems you know befuddled about how to deal with it um, or or anyone else, it all feeds the continual narrative that the GOP has bought into what Donald Trump started out with about this election. They refuse to move off of it and they're going to ride and die with it. Uh, it's, it's still so staggering just, just to hear you say it all out loud and, and put it that way. Claire McCaskill, I keep thinking that what, what this reporting and this recreation of the timeline erases any doubt that the Republican, and I hate to use this word in the gutter because it, it, it's, it's not nice to gutters, but they're in the toilet bowl with this muck, this dirty underbelly of American political society. And when you look at the res- where the investigation's going and where the arrests are, they are arresting members of the Proud Boys. They are moving toward investigating and perhaps charging the conspiracy and, and perhaps um, more serious charges of sedition. So that real, the people that were listening are the people that stormed the Capitol, raising Trump flags. It erases any doubt about where the conversation was was between. It was between Republicans and the president and white supremacists, Proud Boys on the other side who carried out the crime that they thought they were directed to carry out. Mitch McConnell made a cool calculation in the days after the election. Mm-hmm. He knew what Donald Trump was going to try to do. He knew it was wrong. He knew it was a lie but he was trying to hold power in the Senate. Everything he did in those 77 days was all about, up until the Georgia runoff election, was all about winning those Senate seats in Georgia. He thought, he was in a boxed canyon, and he thought if he placated Trump, Trump would do what they needed him to do to promote those candidates in Georgia and get them across the finish line. Of course, Trump didn't care ultimately about that. All he cared about was himself. So it was one of the few times you see Mitch McConnell make a very bold mistake when it came to a political calculation. If he just would have done the right thing, the outcome would not have been any different. But maybe he could have saved some lives in the process. They were all just looking the other way, hoping it would go away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mike, that's some of the most stunning um, part of the, the new reporting is this window into what Claire just described quite accurately, Mitch McConnell's calculations and his staff trying to sort of hold the line on those two Senate, op- Senate runoffs. Um, that backfired spectacularly, and McConnell lost control of his caucus anyway. There was a notion amongst top Republicans and aides to the president and people who were working on his legal team that at some point, the president was going to give up and that he wasn't going to take this this far. Now, I find that a bit surprising because I think that if you looked at the president's pattern of behavior throughout his four years in office, to see that he would question an election to the ends of the earth was not surprising, at least to me. But that seems to have been a theme, that they thought that the norms were going to kick in. They thought that the president was going to act like a typical president who has lost an election. And that just never happened. And as we wrote in this piece, almost 8,000 words, anchored by our colleague, Jim Rutenberg, the events build on themselves from the middle of November Mm. with the early allegations about Dominion, the specious claims about foreign interference in the voting systems and all the gobbledygook from Giuliani. They build and build and build on each other until that final chapter, that bookend being January 6th, the incident that happens at the Capitol as the election is being certified. And you see how the president cooked up these these doubts and feelings amongst his base. And the result being obviously this, you know, ugly, ugly insurrection. Okay, so that was uh, from MSNBC. That's from Deadline White House. Uh, Nicole Wallace, February 1st, 2021. So check out that clip. Uh, We're going to post the link here. And it's dealing with the um, bombshell reporting from the New York Times dealing with uh, 77 days. And we have it up right here. 
77 days, Trump's campaign to subvert the election. Hours after the United States voted, the president declared the election a fraud, a lie that unleashed a movement that would shatter democratic norms and upend the peaceful transfer of power. So it, very quickly here, if we look at this article, uh, by Thursday, the 12th of November, Donald Trump's election lawyers were concluding that the reality he faced was the inverse of the narrative he was promoting in his comments and on Twitter. There was no substantial evidence of election fraud and there were and and there were. Uh, nowhere near enough irregularities, quote unquote, irregularities to reverse the outcome in the courts. This is why you had uh, about 60 uh, lawsuits and basically all of them were thrown out. Donald Trump did not, did, did not, could not win the election, not by a lot or even a little. His presidency would soon be over. Allegations of democratic malfeasance had disintegrated in embarrassing fashion. A supposed suitcase of illegal ballots in Detroit, where I am, proved to be a box of camera equipment. Dead voters were turning up alive in television and newspaper interviews. Their whole, their whole lie was just coming apart right in front of their faces. Everything was just blowing up and all the lies were just blowing up in front of their faces. The week was coming to a particularly demoralizing close. In Arizona, the Trump lawyers were preparing to withdraw their main lawsuit as the state tally showed Joseph uh, R. Biden leading by more than 10,000 votes against the 191 ballots they had, had identified for challenge. As Trump met with colleagues to discuss strategy, the president's deputy campaign manager, Justin Clark, was urgently summoned to the Oval Office. Donald Trump's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, was on speakerphone pressing the president to file a federal suit in Georgia, in Georgia, and sharing conspiracy theory, and sharing a conspiracy theory gaining traction in conservative media that Dominion Systems voting machines had transformed thousands of Trump votes into Biden votes. Now, I want y'all to understand, Rudy Giuliani has been hit with a $1.3 billion defamation lawsuit by Dominion voting systems because they're saying he was lying about them in, uh, in the media, okay? But behind this, claiming that uh, thousands of votes were switched from uh, Trump to Biden. He's been hit with a $1.3 billion defamation lawsuit behind this. So let's continue here. Uh, so Mr. Clark warned that the lawsuit Rudy Giuliani had in mind would be dismissed on procedural grounds. And the state audit was barreling toward a conclusion that the Dominion machines had operated without interference or foul play. Rudy Giuliani called uh, Mr. Clark a liar, according to people with direct knowledge of the exchange. Mr. Clark called Rudy Giuliani something much worse. And with that, the election law experts were sidelined in favor of the former New York City mayor, the man who once again was telling Donald Trump what he wanted to hear. Thursday, the 12th was the day Donald Trump's flimsy long shot legal effort to reverse his election loss turned into something Entire, it turned into something else entirely, an extra legal campaign to subvert the election rooted in a lie so convincing to some of his most devoted followers that it made the deadly January 6th assault on the Capitol almost inevitable, that it made 
the deadly January 6th assault on the U.S. Capitol almost inevitable. Weeks later, Donald Trump is the former president. In, in coming days, a presidential transition like no other will be dissected when he stands trial in the U.S. Senate on an impeachment charge of incitement of insurrection. Yet his lies of an election stolen by corrupt and evil forces lives on in a divided America. A New York Times examination of the 77 democracy bending days between election and inauguration, inauguration January 20th, election November 3rd, shows how the conspiratorial belief rife in a country ravaged by pandemic, a lie that Donald Trump had been grooming for years, finally overwhelmed the Republican Party and as break after break fell away, was propelled forward by new and more radical lawyers, political organizers, financiers, and and the surround sound right-wing media. In the aftermath of that broken afternoon at the U.S. Capitol, a picture has emerged of entropic forces coming together on Trump's behalf in an ad hoc yet ca uh, calamitous crash of rage and denial. But interviews with central players and documents including previously unreported emails, videos, and social media posts scattered across the web tell a more encompassing story of a more coordinated campaign, a more encompassing story of a more coordinated campaign. So I guess they've been listening to, Don, to John Witherspoon You've got to coordinate. I guess, I guess that's where they got that from. I don't know. Read the rest of that article. 77 days Trump, Trump's campaign to subvert the election from the Washington Post. It's a deep, deep expose. They're blowing the lid off of all of this. Now, so then you have some further developments. Um. We're just going to highlight them here for the sake of time. Go read these articles. You have um, uh, CBS News uh, has an article. That we, we, we posted it today. Uh, Democrats impeachment managers plan to use social media, uh, social media post. Let's see. Let's pull this up here. Democrats impeachment managers plan to use social media posts from Capitol assault in case against Trump because all the evidence is right there. Well, most of it, most of the evidence is right there. They recorded it. They recorded themselves. Hi, mom. I'm trying to overthrow the government. <laughs> I'll be home for dinner. <laughs> House impeachment managers plan. Now, this article is from February 1st, 2021. House impeachment managers plan to use social media video from the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol in their presentation during former Donald Trump's Senate trial. OK, his impeachment trial. Uh, to help demonstrate why they believe the former president should be in the seat. Let me see how big we can get this. While the former president should be convicted, according to a source familiar with planning for the trial. Donald Trump's response to the article of impeachment is due on Tuesday, February 2nd. Also due on Tuesday is the House is the House's pre-trial briefs where they will lay out much of their arguments against Trump. Trump's pre-trial briefs will be presented on February 8th. The trial is set to begin on February 9th. Okay, check out the rest of this. Okay, check out the rest of this article here from CBS News. CBSnews.com. Democrats impeachment managers plan to use social media posts from Capitol assault in case against Trump because there's so much evidence right out there. They recorded their dumbasses. I mean, you know, my favorite type of white supremacist is a dumbass white supremacist. They recorded themselves. 
you know, doing all that stuff. So, and then they posted on social media. The, the evidence is there. Okay, <laughs> the, the evidence is right there. You can't say this wasn't you. <laughs> all right. So then, also, you got uh, Representative Margie uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, this, this idiotic conspiracy theory QAnon lady from Georgia. All this, all these crazy ass people in Georgia. Uh, they're trying to make it harder for African Americans to vote. Okay, they're, they're going after Stacey Abrams, and you got crazy QAnon conspiracy theorists. Uh, also, all this, you know, <laughs> all this nonsense going on in Georgia. So Moscow Mitch McConnell, speaking of nonsense, Moscow Mitch McConnell, he said, "Cancer for the Republican Party." Cancer for the cancer for cancer for the Republican Party. McConnell condemns quote unquote loony lies and sweep at Marjorie Taylor Greene. Somebody who suggested that horrifying school shootings were pre-staged is not living in reality. <laughs> this is what this is what Mitch McConnell said. This is what Mitch McConnell said. <laughs> he said, "Yeah, but but hold on, um, you put up with Trump so you can get your conservative judges." Uh, uh, confirmed you put up with trump so you can get your conservative judges confirmed you push through 225 cons conservative judges in the three years to get them confirmed so this is the grim reaper see i think the grim reaper made a a deal with the devil and he's he's realizing that it wasn't always cracked up to be but loony lies and conspiracy theories are cancer for the republican party and our country Moscow Mitch McConnell, Senate Minority Leader, said Monday after, question, after questions about Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, quote, somebody who suggested that perhaps no airplane hit the Pentagon on 9-11, that horrifying school shootings were pre-staged, and that the Clintons crashed JFK, JFK Jr.'s airplane is not living in reality. Okay, <laughs> read, the, <laughs> read the rest of this article here also. All right, so then... You have this taking place, right? But then Donald Trump was having problems trying to get some new attorneys. Now, in his first in his first impeachment trial, you know, and the, and the fact that you have to say first impeachment trial for a president, implying that there's a second impeachment trial. I mean, that's that's just horrific, right there. That's never happened before. That's how horrible of a president he was. But you had all these people that wanted to be Trump's president. They want to come to defend them, things like that. Eh, it's not the case now. If we look at this from CNN, um, he had five attorneys that left over, like over the weekend, over the past few days. He's got some new. He got some new attorneys. We'll see how long they last. And let's see, where is that one? Okay, it's coming up. Here we go. I'm trying to bring this up. So he's got some new attorneys, and we'll see. We'll see how long they last. Now, the sticking point is that beyond the attorneys arguing that it was unconstitutional, it's unconstitutional for the impeachment trial to take place because Trump has already left office, and you can't remove him from office because he's already left office. Be, 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 so they're arguing that it's unconstitutional. They, they're not arguing that he's innocent. The, the, their main argument is not that he's innocent. Oh, he didn't do it. Oh, he didn't incite insurrection. The main argument is, oh, it's unconstitutional because he, he already left office. But what Trump wanted them to do was go beyond that, and he's still going with the bit. He What, what he wanted to do is, is have them argue widespread voter fraud and the election was stolen and they weren't going to do that so they quit okay now you know one of his spokespeople said it was uh, uh i think we look dumbass jason miller said that the split was mutual i'm sure it was mutual well, they said we out of here get out of here with this nonsense they said we out of here he said okay <laughs> i'm sure it was mutual trump trump names two new lawyers for impeachment trial a day after his defense team collapsed. Trump names two new lawyers for impeachment trial a day after his defense team collapsed. 
Read this. This is this. Sit down when you read it. This is a good laugh. February 1st, 2021. Former disgraced former president Donald Trump's office announced that David Schoen and Bruce L. Castor Jr. will now head the legal team for his second impeachment trial a day after CNN first reported that five members of his defense left and his team effectively collapsed. One point of friction with his previous team was Trump wanted the attorneys to focus on his election fraud claims rather than the constitutionality of convicting a former president. He wanted them to push all these idiotic conspiracy theories and go into a, a Senate trial with conspiracy theories. Trump has struggled to find lawyers willing to take his case and he refuses to budge from his false claims. Trump's advisors have been talking to him about his legal strategy and he keeps bringing up <laughs> and he keeps bringing up election fraud for his defense while they have repeatedly tried to steer him away from that according to a source familiar with those discussions. <laughs> He's got a head full of mush. <laughs> They've been trying to make legal arguments and he's got a head full of mush throwing out all these dumbass conspiracy theories. This was the guy who was in the White House. <laughs> this, this, this is who these Republicans voted for in 2016. This is who they wanted. He was supposed to lead them to the promised land. <laughs> okay, so it's unclear whether Sean and Castor will go along with Trump's wants. Now, quote, Sean has already been working with the 45th president and other advisors to prepare for the upcoming trial, and both Sean and Castor agree that his impeachment is unconstitutional, a fact 45 senators voted in agreement with last week. Now, most legal scholars say he can still be convicted, and also, it, it, we have to understand the impeachment of Trump started while he was still in office. He was impeached in the House of Representatives while he was still in office. Now, most legal scholars say that the trial is not unconstitutional. Okay, but but just think about just think about how just think about how uh, the attorneys know he's guilty. They're not arguing. Oh, he's innocent. He didn't do it. You got the wrong guy. Oh no, he didn't mean that. He but that's not their main argument. Their main argument is not that he's innocent. He's being framed. Who framed Roger Rabbit? No, the main argument is oh, it's unconstitutional to impeach him. He's already left office. I'm, I'm waiting for them to say my 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 client is 100 percent innocent. These charges are these, these these charges, these are trumped up charges. Okay, no pun intended. These are trumped up charges. He's totally innocent. He didn't do it. You're lying. That's not what they're saying. They're saying, oh, this trial is unconstitutional. <laughs> when is Trump giving a damn about the Constitution? That's what I want to know. <laughs> All right. So read the, uh, uh, read the rest of this article. Uh, yeah. We'll see how long they last also. Hopefully Trump will pay them. You know, we'll see how long they last and hopefully Trump will pay them as well okay now um at the beginning of the show we talked about uh let's see we talked about stacy abrams and you know I, i've been covering how republicans are, tr are, tr are proposing new election laws and trying to make it harder for people to vote especially african americans the root.com had an article about this and so did uh black enterprise i'm going to pull up this article from uh black enterprise and you know once again so we see the police in rochester new york scared of a nine-year-old african-american girl so they had the so they had a pepper sprayer we saw white people 1912 1913 scared of uh, uh, were afraid of, they were jealous of 
uh, Sarah Rector, African American girl, and she's uh, richest Afro American girl, African American girl in the, in the country. We we see that, and then we see um, Republicans scared of big bad Stacey Abrams. So much so that they they've launched a Stop Stacy campaign, you know. And um, sometimes you just I, I sit back and I look at these people, and I wonder if they're playing with a full deck. If we look at this article here from um, BlackEnterprise dot com. Republicans launched Stop Stacey Abrams campaign to keep her from governor in 2022. 2022. So I, I thought they would. Uh, now, I noticed that in their statement here. They didn't talk about how good their policy is going to be for African-Americans. That's just something that I noticed. Okay, so you're running a campaign to stop her, but you're not really telling African Americans why they should vote for you or vote for your candidate. But they don't, I don't even think they have a candidate right now. So this is from February 1st, 2021. And they talk about a new group launched this effort Monday to target voting rights activists and former uh, uh, voting rights activists and former Georgia gubernatorial nominee Stacey Abrams, who is the likely who is likely to challenge Republican Governor Brian Kemp next year because she lost to Brian Kemp in 2018. The independent group known as Stop Stacy, Stop Stacy, said they will build a robust state and national fundraising operation targeting Stacey Abrams with opposition research, digital ads, and other media resources, according to Fox News. In the release, the group described itself as, quote, a national grassroots organization of engaged conservatives who are committed to protecting our future from Stacey Abrams. Stacey Abrams is such a threat that she, she, Stacey Abrams is a threat to the American way of life. They're like, she's the black boogie woman or something. A national grassroots organization of engaged conservatives who are committed to protecting our future from Stacey Abrams, her left wing backers and their radical un-American agenda. What's the un-American agenda? What's the, what's, what's the un-American agenda? Racial justice? Equal rights? What's the un-American agenda? Fight for 15? What, what's the un-American agenda? I, I'm trying to figure this out. Quote, after losing the White House, after losing the White House, in United States Senate in 2020, grassroots Republicans across Georgia and America are standing together to stop radical Stacey Abrams. Now, remember in that little phone call, the trader in chief Donald Trump had with, sec with Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger and Raffensperger's staff. Trump had some very negative things to say about Stacey Abrams, and he called Stacey Abrams corrupt. If that ain't the pot calling the kettle black, I don't know what is, but he called Stacey Abrams corrupt. Go back and listen to that one hour and two minute phone call, that conference call. All right. So these statements here from this white from this right wing group. Uh, is echoing those sentiments. Grassroots Republicans across Georgia and America are standing together 
together to stop radical Stacey Abrams. Stacey Abrams is, I mean, I mean you, I mean, they, they act like she's the, the Antichrist or something. I mean, Stacey Abrams, is that terrifying to Republicans? This statement was made by Stop Stacey, senior strategist Jeremy Brand, in a statement. There is no time to waste. Hold on just a second. Let's jump around. There's no time to waste. We must stand up, fight back, and stop Stacey. Now, Abrams also, a Abrams, along with the coronavirus pandemic, are largely the reasons Donald Trump is no longer president. In 2018, Stacey Abrams became the first African American female gubernatorial nominee of a major political party. However, she lost the election to Brian Kemp, we know about that, who was accused of widespread voter suppression. Stacey Abrams acknowledged she lost, but never conceded to Kemp, arguing that his former, uh, arguing that his former post as Secretary, Secretary of State made it easy for him to suppress votes. In the aftermath, Stacey Abrams founded the voting rights group Fair Fight, okay, Fair Fight, which in addition to becoming a fundraising behemoth for Democrats in Georgia, got more than 200,000 African Americans in the state registered to vote. You think maybe that's what they're afraid of? It, it, you, you think maybe maybe it's not so much her policies they're afraid of. They're afraid that she got more than 200,000 African Americans registered to vote and she raised so much money. You, you, think, maybe that's what is, you think maybe that's what they're scared of? Because they didn't make an argument for why their policies are better. Notice that. They didn't make an argument for why their policies are better and better for African Americans. At the same time, in the state legislatures, in various states, including Georgia, Republicans are trying to pass laws to make it harder for African Americans to vote. But wait a second, didn't you just talk about something being un-American? And you're trying to pass laws to make it harder for African Americans to vote who had to fight for a 15th Amendment because it was illegal for us to vote? I'm not talking about the Civil Rights Act of 65. I'm talking about the 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. You, you, you sit back and look at this, and then you have, because Back again at the Guardian from the article, uh, the article from the Guardian in 2021, legislative in, in 2021 legislative sessions, lawmakers in 28 states have pushed a whopping 106 bills that will restrict voting access. That don't sound too American to me. This from January 30th, 2021. And uh, so, you, so you have this one, and then we uh, let's see uh, a new report from the Brennan Center for Justice shows just how effectively Republicans have been talking out of both sides of their mouths at once, decrying the violence over false allegations of election rigging, and at the same time using false allegations of voter fraud to make make it harder for people to vote. In 2021 legislative sessions, which six states haven't even begun yet, as of January 30th, lawmakers in 28 states have pushed a whopping 106 bills that will restrict voting access. Okay, a according to the Brennan Center, that's three times the number of restrictive voting laws that were introduced by February 3rd of 2020. According to the Brennan Center, that's three times the number of restrictive voting laws that were introduced by February 3rd, 2020. I wonder what happened between February 3rd, 2020 and in the January 2021 that make them want to pass so many new laws to make it harder for people to vote. 
These laws are clearly responsive to widespread conspiracy theories on the right, conspiracy theories started by the Republican Party and the former president. Each one of the, each one of the 106, each one of the 106 bills aims to make voting harder either by scaling back vote by mail, imposing stricter uh, voter identification laws, limiting policies that successfully registered large numbers of voters, or allow states to more easily and aggressively purge their voter rolls. Well, that, that, that don't sound too inclusive to me. That doesn't sound like you're trying to encourage people to vote. It doesn't sound like you're trying to win people with your policies. It sounds like you're trying to suppress voters, especially African-American voters. Then you have Republicans who launched the Stop Stacy campaign in Georgia. Hmm. Now, these black so-called conservatives, these black so-called conservatives that are that are that are uh, running around trying to tell African Americans that we should vote for them. Uh, are they going to speak out against this? They going to they going to denounce this at all? Are they going to speak out against this? They're going to denounce this at all. That, that's what I want to know. Um, because I haven't heard any of them denounce this. They need to hold a press conference and come out and denounce this type of behavior, this type of chicanery, this type of hoodwinking and bamboozling. So check out those articles. And uh, I, I'm waiting for a press conference. Angela K. Stanton and F. Lee Francis and Candace Owens and James C. Harris and Terrence Williams, Bruce Lavelle, Pastor Daryl Scott, Alveda King. I'm diamond and silk. I'm waiting for them to hold a collective press conference and denounce what their party's doing. But while I wait on that, let's talk about this story here out of Rochester, New York. How's everybody doing? I think this is the last story. Um, so a lot of people have been talking about this. And... Right, uh, Rochester police pepper sprayed a nine-year-old girl, nine-year-old African-American girl. And yes, she was having, you know, mental issues, things like that. I want to go to the story here from uh, NBC News. Let's look at this article from NBC News. Uh, the officers have been suspended. Mayor Lovely Warren has uh, suspended the officers. Uh, let's see here. Here we go. So the officers involved in the incident were suspended while an internal investigation is conducted. A spokesman for Mayor Lovely Warren, Warren said Rochester police pepper sprayed a nine year old girl. Why didn't a crisis team respond? Why didn't a crisis team respond? So uh, Rochester, New York, uh, Mayor Lovely Warren said the city, the city's recently launched team that provides non-law enforcement response to some emergency calls did not respond to an incident in which police pepper sprayed a nine-year-old girl because of the nature of the 911 call, okay? So they have a, because of protest, Black Lives Matter protests, civil rights activists, things like this, there has been efforts in different cities to take a different response when it comes to people who are having mental health issues, as opposed to sending an officer with a gun 
Some, like here in the city of Rochester, New York, they are trying to respond with medical professionals as opposed to somebody with a gun. The problem is, with this response, you need the medical professionals and not somebody with a gun. All right, so, quote, unfortunately, this was not an incident where PIC, person in crisis team, would have been called, Mayor Lovely Warren said Sunday. This call did not come in a form that would have all that that would have alerted the PIC team. It came in a way that would have alerted the response that was given, which was our police department. End quote. Now, Deputy Police Chief Andre Anderson said Sunday that a that at three twenty one p.m. on Friday. Officers responded to a report of family trouble. He said officers were made aware that a nine-year-old girl was suicidal. Okay, a nine-year-old girl was suicidal. So right there, that tells you that it's some type of uh, uh, some type of mental health issue. It's some type of crisis. Okay. She indicated that she wanted to kill herself, and she wanted to kill her mom. She indicated she wanted to kill herself and she wanted to kill her mom. Deputy Police Chief Andre Anderson said he says she initially tried to run away. Now, Rochester police released a uh, body camera video Sunday that showed the young girl being handcuffed while she screamed repeatedly for her father and pepper sprayed uh, and pepper, pepper sprayed by police officers. An undisclosed number of officers were suspended Monday while an internal investigation is uh, being conducted, Mayor Lovely Warren's spokesman said. Okay, now the incident came nearly a week after Mayor Lovely Warren announced the launch of the Person in Crisis Team, the Person in Crisis Team, uh, saying it would provide a compassionate non-law enforcement emergency response to people experiencing emotional or behavioral turmoil. Mayor Lovely Warren said the pilot program would run through June with the goal of continuing and continuously improving, improving it, okay? Now, the concept sounds good, and I've said this before. You, you, you know, you need law enforcement to do their job, not we don't want police brutality we want police officers to do their job but you also have to allocate resources for mental health professionals education things like this that go into uh reducing the need for police officers to have to respond that address poverty that uh and 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 redirecting a lot of these resources will help reduce crime overall also now, the 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week team provides alternative responses to emergency calls that involve mental health, substance abuse, and related issues. Mayor Warren said Sunday that the goal is to be able to provide a joint response when necessary to improve how we protect the community. How we protect the community. Now, this incident will certainly inform those uh, efforts. However, we should not unfairly disparage or demean the efforts of the team when they are truly not at fault. Now, Rochester, New York, formed the person in crisis team as part of a response to the death of Daniel Prude. OK, Daniel Prude in police custody in 2020. Rochester police were widely criticized in September when it was disclosed that Daniel Prude, an African-American man, suffocated to death. in. Um, in March of uh, 2020, after officers uh, had placed him in a spit hood, the body camera video in Daniel Prude's case was released six months after his death, only after his family sued the city. The video showed Daniel Prude, who appeared to be having a mental health crisis, handcuffed and naked with a spit hood over his head. Police commanders had urged city officials to hold off on publicly releasing the video. I said, okay. Um,
Okay, so Mayor Warren said police chief Cynthia uh, Harriet Sullivan alerted her about the video of the nine-year-old girl, nine-year-old girl uh, being pepper sprayed Friday. Mayor Warren said that she reviewed it early Saturday and that it was released to the public Sunday about 48 hours after the incident. Warren said the video was from the cameras of two officers, including the officer who pepper sprayed the girl. As we finish red acting, the uh, as we finish red acting, the others will make those available as well. Now, uh, Warren, who said the girl, Mayor Warren, who said the girl reminded her of her 10 year old daughter appeared emotional at times. She said, I can tell you that this video as a mother is not anything that you want to see. This is not something that any of us should want to justify, can, justi can justify, and it's something we have to change. It's not an option. Uh, okay, so they talk about the video. Police did not return requests for comment Monday. Warren says she has spoken to the girl's mother and that she was concerned about protecting the girl's identity. Um, at one point in the video, an officer tells the nine-year-old girl, nine-year-old African-American girl, you're acting like a child. The girl responds, I am a child. He tells the nine-year-old girl, you're acting like a child. She responds, I am a child. An officer tries to get her into the back of the police car so he can be taken to, so she can be taken to the hospital, um, said the deputy uh, police chief. Quote, and as he did that over, over time, the young girl refused. She thrashed around. She actually at one point kicked one of the officers in the chest and knocked his body worn camera around. But uh, Deputy Police Chief Anderson said it did not appear that the girl was resisting the officers. She was trying not to be restrained to go to the hospital. It did not appear that the girl was resisting officers. She was trying not to be restrained to go to the hospital, uh, he said. Uh, as the officers made numerous attempts to get her in the car, one of them sprayed her with pepper spray. And and the effects of that did work, he said, which is concerning to the city and po and police officials. That's what the concern that we have is, is the method that was used at the time. So um, the young girl was taken to Rochester General Hospital and later released. Now. Uh, OK, so read the rest of this article here. Um, the harrowing, the harrowing experience endured by a nine-year-old girl in our community, including being handcuffed and pepper sprayed, should never happen to another child. Okay, so read the rest of that. All right now, this ties into adultification bias, and. I was looking for the article and I have to see, did it come? Oh yeah, I think it came up here. This ties into adultification bias. You can watch the video in the, in the clip there. I mean, in the article from NBC News. I've talked about adultification bias before. And adultification bias with African-American girls and it deals with how um, it deals with how the views that society have about African American women, the negative views society has about African American women, gets transferred to African American girls, and African American girls are oftentimes perceived as being older than they actually are, less innocent than they actually are knowing more about adult topics like sex and and the innocence that young white girls have and the benefit of the doubt that young white girls are given oftentimes are not afforded to african-american girls 
And this deals with adultification bias. Now, I talked about this when I did my panel discussion dealing with Cardi B, Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion's song WAP. Go back and watch that because I get deep into this and I connect all this together. Abduction of African-American women, the dehumanization of African-American women, uh, uh, the dehumanization of African-American women coming from slavery. The, uh, the sexuality of African-American women being a commodity. I tie all that into adultification bias because it's all is it's all connected. And it deals with dehumanizing African-Americans, especially African-American women. All of this is connected. Okay, so if we look at this uh, article here, this is one of them. I have uh, a number of different different, uh, articles dealing with uh, adultification bias. This is just one of them. This is from uh, this article from The Root. I'm not a big fan of The Root, but they do have some good articles every now and then. This is from May 16th, 2019. Surprising no, surprising no one, Georgetown study confirms previous findings on adultification bias by listening to black women and girls. Uh, in 2017, because I reported on this when these studies came out, 2017 and 2019. In 2017, the Georgetown a law center on poverty and inequality. The, George, the Georgetown Law Center on Poverty and Inequalities Initiative on Gender, Justice, and Opportunity released a study called Girlhood Interrupted, the Erasure of Black Girls' Childhood. Girlhood Interrupted, the Erasure of Black Girls' Childhood providing concrete data that adults typically perceive black girls, okay, adults typically perceive black girls, particularly those aged 5 to 14, to be more adult-like and less innocent than their white peers. Ages 5 to 15, Adults often, oftentimes perceive African-American girls, particularly those ages 5 to 15, to be more adult-like and less innocent than their white peers. Via responses garnered from a series of focus groups, the research team proved a type of gendered racial bias unique to black girls. Gendered racial bias unique to black girls. Previous research had already proven the same bias against African-American boys. Dr. Philip Atiba Goff has done a lot of research dealing with this adultification bias when it comes to African-American boys. The general response from black women and girls, uh, okay, glad y'all finally noticed. Uh, let me see. Uh, Georgetown made good on the promise published in the report on the second phase of the study, listening to black women and girls lived experiences of adultification bias. Uh, let's see here. To recap the study findings, black girls routinely experience adultification bias. Adultification is linked to harsher treatment and higher standards for black girls in school. Negative stereotypes. Negative stereotypes of African-American women are mapped onto black girls or projected onto black girls, which can lay the foundation for adultification bias. Adults attempt to enforce traditional white norms of femininity on black girls. Adultification bias can lead educators to treat black girls in developmentally, developmentally inappropriate ways. Adults have less empathy Adults have less empathy for black girls than their white peers who are viewed as more innocent and in need of protection and comforting. Socialized adultification contributes to adultification bias. Okay, so check out this study. Let's check out this article. Read the study. There was one from 2017 uh, that's important uh, as well. That was the first one from... uh, 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 from Georgetown, uh, George, Georgetown Law Center on Poverty and Inequ- uh, Inequality. 
Uh, so check this out here. It's from May 16, 2019, Maisha Kai for uh, The Root. Surprising no one, Georgetown study confirms previous findings on adultification bias. Okay. And I'm going to, I'm going to re-air the uh, panel discussion I did on Cardi B's WAP. And I tie this into negative corporate control hip hop. And I also did a, uh, a segment of my show dealing with Snoop, uh, Snoop Dogg's comments about Cardi B's WAP um, a couple, two or three months ago, something like that. And uh, I'm going to splice all of that together. Because he's looking at it from the perspective of uh, a man almost 50 years old with a daughter. Who's done all of what he's done. And, he, and he's saying, look, he's basically saying, look, this is not cool. And it's not. And one of the things I talked about is, have you, is how you have a white corporation, Atlantic Records. That financed this song and financed the music video. And the baseline says repeatedly there's some whores in this house there's some whores in this house and basically everybody in the house except for kylie jenner is of african descent and when you look when you go to azlyrics.com and you read the uncensored lyrics you have a white corporation basically promoting marketing lyrics that promote prostitution and the dehumanization of of African women. And the first day that the video was released on Cardi B's YouTube channel, it was viewed 26 million times in one day. It was viewed about 60 million times that weekend just on Cardi B's YouTube channel alone. So when I did the broadcast, when I did the panel discussion, I wasn't attacking Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion. They're being used. I think they're being used. The white corporation that financed this, they really need to be held accountable. And the reason why is because they're never going to have a top white female artist do the same type of song and do the same type of video. They will never do that. They're not going to have Taylor Swift. They're not going to have any of these of any of these top white female artists put out a song with sexually explicit lyrics like that and market it. The reason why they won't do it is because you only protect what you respect. You only protect what you respect. They're not going to have a top white female artist. And the baseline of the song says there's some whores in this house. And they're, and, they're, and, and, and they're putting out sexually explicit lyrics because they know whatever is disseminated is imitated. They know that whatever is disseminated is imitated. And if they have a white female artist doing that, then you're going to have white girls imitating that. And they're not going to tolerate but they'll let Negroes do that because you only protect what you respect. And we still haven't figured this out. So power is the ability to define and shape reality and have other people accept your definition of reality as if it were their own. So this is why um, you hear me talk about African history and culture it gives us our foundation. It gives us our values, our interests, and our principles. It gives us a cultural paradigm that we see reality through. It gives us standards. That's an example of what happens when you don't have standards. Okay? That's what happens when you don't have standards. All right. So, hey, uh, okay, so that was, uh, I think that was the last story. It wasn't, we still got to go. <laughs> it's time. <laughs> All right, that's enough radio for the day. Um, 
Hey, if you like this type of information, you can donate to the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, and at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, click on the yellow donate button. So we're here six days a week. And so the donations help us to like really uh, stay on the air, keep broadcasting. Um, for four years, we were doing Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, WFDF. Now we're on six as of October 12, 2020. We're on six days a week. So uh, uh, we're here Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight Eastern Standard Time and Sundays. So the donations help us to keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, pay some of these bills because I had to take care of a lot of stuff today. That's one of the reasons why I'm tired. Uh, <laughs> then also uh, at our website, my DVD lectures, digital downloads are there. Uh, also, uh, don't forget, register for my online course. OK. Uh, yeah, I blocked that dumbass. Uh, register for my uh, don't forget to register for my online course, Ancient Kemet. The Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We deal with thousands of years of history. It's going to start up uh, Wednesday, February 3rd, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can email me at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com for more information. ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com for more information. We'll post the link here also. And the link's also on our website, africanhistorynetwork.com as well. Uh, we rebroadcast shows throughout the day because I'm using Restream that helps me rebroadcast the show. I just paid them their money. Uh, <laughs> so, and I should be back on Roland Martin Unfiltered this Friday. I was supposed to be on last Friday, but they they, they canceled the panel because they uh, dedicated the whole show to uh, Cicely Tyson because Cicely Tyson had passed away the day before. So I should be back on. I'm usually a panelist on Roland Martin Unfiltered uh, each Friday, okay? And uh, follow Roland Martin on uh, Facebook, at uh, Roland Martin on Facebook, and also on YouTube at uh, Roland Martin on YouTube as well. Okay, yeah, email me at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com. Also, African-American business owners, um, email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com, and we'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. All right, look, hey, we have to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring, inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, this corrects wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you. Uh, we'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. Thanks for tuning in. With BlackBusinessTea.com, the messages are clear and meaningful. Keep your business in the black and out of the red. Mind your black business, know your numbers, and plan strategically. Black business boss, lead your industry. Support black business, encourage, patronize, and uplift one another. BlackBusinessTea.com currently has products sold in Detroit, Atlanta, Chicago, and Los Angeles with proceeds returned to the black community. They have a wide selection of hoodies, t-shirts, mugs, hats, sweatshirts that support black owned businesses. Visit the website blackbusinesstea.com. That's blackbusinesstea.com. For 25 years, the Black History 101 Mobile Museum has carried on the rich legacy of the Black Museum movement in America by showcasing original artifacts of the Black experience at colleges, universities, K-12 schools, corporations, libraries, conferences, and cultural events, making it the most traversed Black History mobile exhibit in American history. Dr. Khalid L. Kim is the founder of the Black History 101 Mobile Museum, and he is a highly sought after public speaker on topics of black history, social studies, education, museum studies, hip hop and race relations. Dr. Khalid was named among the change makers for NBC Universal's Race the Hate campaign and listed as one of the 100 men of distinction for black enterprise.
He recently founded the Michigan Hip Hop Archive on the campus of Western Michigan University. The Black History One on One Mobile Museum is currently scheduling in person and virtual exhibits nationwide. For more information, please contact Dr. Khalid Al Hakim directly at 313 645 4197. 313 645 4197. Or visit their website at blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. That's blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. You can also email him at bhistory101 at yahoo.com. bhistory101 at yahoo.com. Soul Natural Beauty Products offers organic plant-based skin and hair care products that will rejuvenate skin and naturally grow and thicken hair. Their whipped shea butter can heal or restore damaged skin cells to prevent hyperpigmentation and skin breakouts. All products are made with organic plant-based ingredients. Their maximum hair growth oil is fortified with organic herbal extracts and undeniably proves that Mother Nature knows best. It thickens, lengthens, softens, and conditions all types of hair. They even guarantee hair improvement within 90 days or a full refund. Their all-natural 24-hour deodorant leaves the body smelling fresh without sweating for up to 24 hours. It does not stain fabric, goes on smoothly, and has a refreshing lavender and frankincense aroma. It can be used by men, women, and even children. Place your order today at SoulNaturalBeautyProducts.com. That's SoulNaturalBeautyProducts.com. And follow them on Facebook at Soul Natural Beauty Products. Do you have an idea or business that requires app development or thinking of moving your IT resources to the cloud? We have post-paid and profit-sharing plans for unique ideas or profitable businesses. Who can take advantage of this unique program? Entrepreneurs with unique ideas, startups, small to medium businesses. Contact us, 267-209-0352. Visit nomadicsystems.net, nomadicsystems.net today. Gain knowledge in minutes with Blacklist Ed. Blacklist Ed is an app that provides insightful summaries of books pertaining to the black experience. As black people, we know the importance of reading books to discover our incredible contributions to world history, to uplift our self-esteem, and to empower ourselves for our relentless fight for social justice. Unfortunately, with our busy lives, it feels like there is never enough time to read a book. Fortunately, there's a solution. With Blacklist Ed, their app provides key insights from best-selling books about the black experience, therefore saving you time, increasing your knowledge, and empowering yourself through inspirational and actionable ideas. You can read or listen on the go. Start your free trial today by going to blacklisted.com. That's black without the C, B-L-A-K. Or you can download the Blacklist Ed app from the App Store or Google Play. Blacklist Ed, empower yourself. Have you seen the world famous No Frowny Brownie yet from the Pink Bakery? If not, what are you waiting for? They are vegan, gluten-free, and free the big eight allergens. While eating their No Frowny Brownies, the fabulous Miss Tabitha Brown said they were very good, very good. And you know, if she says that, y'all, the Pink Bakery is the first black owned big eight allergen free baking mix company. Go to the pinkbakery.com. That's the pinkbakery.com to order their no frowny brownie mix today. Yaya Rule is a line of African print inspired apparel catered to the black community. The pieces include t-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, jackets, dresses, skirts, activewear, bags, and other accessories and home decor. This brand offers a revived way for men and women to wear their black pride and honor their African heritage anywhere at any time. This apparel line is for anyone, whether you are working in the corporate world, are an entrepreneur, or an artist. Their selection will allow you to casually